Okay, folks, good morning. Hope everyone's well. Um, no, <laughs> there was no um, sound until now. Can everybody hear? Just type in the chat box if you can hear. And if you can't hear, type you can't hear. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Okay, so. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, tonight sta starts the, um, the holiday or the festival of Hanukkah. <clears throat> Now, uh, just very briefly, historically, what had happened was uh, the Greeks, the Greek armies <clears throat> had uh, conquered the area, and they laid siege to the temple, eventually broke through the walls, and uh, went in and defiled the temple, <clears throat> did everything that they could to defile the temple by um, <clears throat> finding all the jars of oil that were used to light the menorah. The menorah is the candelabra that was lit in the temple. Uh, they defiled all the oil that they could find and uh, even sacrificed non kosher animals, a pig on the altar, and did everything that they could to, um, to make the place sp uh, spiritually impure. That was their intention, to make the, space, the, the place spiritually impure. Now, <clears throat> the uh, Maccabees, that was a group of, uh, high, uh, include, a, group, a group of priests, uh, the Maccabees, they called themselves Maccabim because it was written on their swords, Mi kamocha ba'elim Hashem, who is like unto you God uh, amongst the mighty. And, um, they eventually were successful in chasing the Greeks out of uh, the temple, rededicating it, and so on and so forth. And uh, they managed to find one jar of oil that was not tainted and not become impure. And they lit the menorah, the candelabra, with that jar of oil. And miraculously, the oil usually was there was enough in one jar to light for to light the menorah, which burned uh, through the night to light it for one day. But miraculously, it actually burned for eight days until they were able to get new pure oil, which uh, they didn't have any supplies left because the Greeks had uh, made them impure, made all the oil impure. <clears throat> In any event, that, that is why we celebrate the eight days of Hanukkah, where we take a candelabra and we light uh, one candle the first day, two candles the second day, three candles the third day, etc., etc., until we get to the eighth night when we light um, eight candles. Now, that in itself is a teaching, a very important teaching, that is called Ma'alin Bakodesh. One always increases in matters of holiness. You never decrease, you only increase in matters of holiness. Now, just to explain that uh, there was, there's a second opinion. The second opinion says that the, uh, the candelabra should be lit eight candles on the first day, then seven, then six, and going down to one on the last day. Why? Because when a miracle happens, there's various explanations. One of them is that when a miracle happens, you sort of get used to it, right? And therefore, it's, uh, it's worth an eight on the first day, only a seven on the second day, and then uh, down to one. That's one of the explanations. There are others. I'm just giving that one. <clears throat> but practically speaking, although there was a disagreement about this in the Talmud, the, um, the conclusion was that we start off with one and then uh, advance to two and then to three, etc., etc., until we get to the eighth. And the eighth is called, in um, Kabbalistic terms, it's called Shomer HaHekev. <laughs> uh, just let me see something over here. One second, we're getting an interesting picture here. Okay. Um, all right. I hope this is, um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to get rid of this picture, but it's only with a picture with a dog here. <laughs> Does anyone else see it? Um, all right, there we go. <laughs> all right. So, 
Um, so let's continue then. So this in itself is a, is, a, is a teaching and an important teaching that you start off with whatever you have. It doesn't matter how much the light is. Obviously, eight candles are much more powerful than one. It can illuminate the darkness much more than one. Don't forget that the candles are always lit at night in the evening as uh, just after sunset. And the whole point of the candles is to illuminate the night. The point of the candelabra in the temple, although there was uh, not much work, there was really little, very little worship that was done in the temple at night. Nevertheless, that's when the candelabra was lit at night. And the reason for it being lit at night is the, uh, that the light would go to the outside, outside world. The, the windows of the temple, when it was built in Jerusalem, the windows of the temple were built in such a way that light went from inside to outside, but not from outside to inside. One explanation is that the windows were narrow on the inside and wide on the outside, so the light could go outwards. Another explanation is that they, they somehow had managed to develop some kind of um, uh, one-way glass so that the light could go out but not come in. Now, how that uh, exactly worked, I'm not sure, but um, obviously they were um, um, quite technologically developed at that time as well. So they would have had that kind of glass. In any event, the point being that the light has to go from inside to outside. <clears throat> Now, we start off with one. In other words, you start off with what you have. Every person has his ounce of light, so to speak, his candle. And I'll speak more about the candle, which is what this class is going to be about, really, in a minute. But in order to be able to get to, uh, to the eight candles, in other words, the full quota of candles, the full light that a person can illuminate the world with, you have to start with one. You have to start somewhere. The point is to start with whatever you have. It doesn't matter if you have the full quota, if you perfected yet or you're not perfect. You start with what you have. A little bit of light pushes away a lot of darkness. Obviously, a lot of light pushes away even more than that. But by starting with what we have and then slowly increasing day after day, you add another thing, you add another thing, you add another thing. You have to start somewhere, but you add, you're constantly adding, you're constantly growing <clears throat> in positive things, in good things, in, in, in positive deeds, in positive actions, in positive uh, thoughts, etc., etc. So then we advance from level to level until eventually we come to the eighth candle. Now, the eighth candle represents, in Kabbalah, represents a very interesting thing. Seven, as we know, is the cycle of time. The seventh day, which is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of creation is the Sabbath day. So we find that in, in, uh, basically in all societies, there is, the, uh, the weekday comp is, is com the, uh, the week is comprised of seven days. Now they did, there, there was an attempt to make, um, I believe in Russia during, um, during Stalin's time, it could have been Lenin, I'm not sure. In any way, there was a certain point in time and they tried to make a 10 day work week, a 10 day week. And it just flopped completely. It flopped completely. It seems that human beings have become comfortable with seven or maybe we were created that way. In fact, there is a, um, uh, there's a good reason for seven. If everybody will remember, in the diagram of the Svirot, the diagram of the Svirot, the seven Svirot, sorry, the, uh, the seven Svirot from Chesed to Malchut. Let me see here if I can share a picture. All right, just one second, folks. I'm going to try and share a picture. This might not work so well. So, um, all right, just hang on. Just hang on while I get the picture up. It's going to go into a different picture, but it just I have to get it up right now. Um, I didn't prepare it beforehand, in other words, which I should have done, but I didn't. So. 
Um, let's see here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can everyone see a diagram of the sphere rot now on the screen or no? Just write in the chat box if you can see a diagram. Yes, you see a diagram of the sphere rot? Oh, perfect. Okay. It's big. Um, can I reduce it? Yes, I can. Okay, better? All right, very good. <clears throat> okay, so um, here I am going to uh, just make a note here of the, can you see the hand? I assume you can, right? Now I can't draw on this because it's a um, PDF, but um, in any event, the, yes, I am recording if some, <laughs> someone asking, yes, I'm recording, yeah. So. The Svirot over here, these Svirot over here, if you count up, there's seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These over here represent the seven days of the week. The seven days of the week. Sunday would be the attribute of Chesed. And then Monday, Gvura. Monday is when we go to work. Gvura, Gvura means uh, harshness, severity, etc. Chesed, kindness, take a day off, right? <laughs> Actually, in Israel, they don't. It's a work day like any other. But in any event, that's called chesed, right? And then there's gvura, harshness. That's the um, the second day of the week, Monday. And then we go on to tiferes, nesachod, yesod. Yesod is Friday. And then the Shabbat, the Sabbath day, is malchut. Malchut, the, the feminine sphira, so to speak. Feminine in the sense of it's the receptive sphira. It's the feminine quality. Everything about Shabbat is 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 uh, the feminine quality. There's a special song that is sung called Eshet Chayil, Eshet Chayil, the woman of valor. And the Shabbat is called a queen, so to speak. In other words, the, again, the female element. In any event, these seven these seven Svirot represent the the seven days of the week. Now. As you uh, might have um, uh, noticed before, we said that Hanukkah is eight days. One day more than the natural cycle of seven, than the cycle of time seven. So it's a day, therefore, that stands beyond the natural cycle of time. In other words, the eighth day is what's called, it's called Shomer HaHekef, the cycle, the, the epicycle, the cycle above the cycle, that which guards the cycle, so to speak. It's the eighth day in, in Kabbalah, it's called the aspect of Makif or so, Soivev, Makif, meaning it, it, it's not encompassed within the seven days of the week. It's, in, it's not encompassed within the inner dimensions of the world, it is a, uh, a transcendent aspect rather than, than an imminent aspect. All these other qualities are imminent. The eighth quality, which actually corresponds to Bina, Bina is the eighth sphera from below to above. We don't count that in this particular um, uh, format. So Bina... Aim Haban, in the mother of the children, the mother of all of these children, of these Svirot, these are derivative Svirot, they derive from Bina. So the mother of children, or Bina, in other words, is called Shomer HaHekev, that is the source of all of them. It, so to speak, guards them, watches over them, but transcends them all. It transcends the cycle of time. It transcends the cycle of time. So Hanukkah, therefore, the eighth day, or the eight days of Hanukkah, if we take it as a single unit, the eight days of Hanukkah represent something which, in, a, in, 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 a, in one way or another, transcends time. All of them are leading up to the sort of transcendent aspect of Hanukkah, where it transcends time. 
Now we saw that actually in the um, in the temple itself when they lit the menorah, even though the menorah there was lit for only um, it was lit the entire it was lit the entire year every day it was uh, every day it was lit, but it was supposed to burn only through the night. In other words, it was lit before sunset, and then it would burn right throughout the night. And sometime in the morning, all of the candles would burn out except one. The candelabra in the temple had only seven branches. Again, corresponding to the seven days of the week, corresponding to, said, to, to these seven attributes. But one of the candles, one of the seven candles, would remain lit, even though it had the same amount of oil within it, and they were miraculously the oil in one jar was enough to fill all of the um, all of the um, cups in the candelabra equally, with an equal amount of oil. But this one, one of them, called the Nehemiah Ravi, the Western Light, burned right through the day. Even though it had the same amount of oil, burned right through the day, and it was only. Um, uh, that night when they came to light it again, they used it to light the menorah once again. And only then did it go out, or they put it out. Okay. So, in the temple itself, there was only seven, even though there was a miracle with, with one of the candles, nevertheless, there was only seven. Hanukkah represents a level which is, in fact, higher than the cycle, the natural cycle of time to present something beyond that. And it is lit at night in order to, so to speak, light up the darkness until the darkness itself becomes light. That is the, uh, that is the idea of Hanukkah. But now, <clears throat> in order to be able to explain really how this works, we have to go back to... Um, we have to go back to the idea of um, what the candle is all about, the secret of the candle. Now, as everybody knows, there are essentially four parts to a candle. Four parts to a candle. The first part of the candle, obviously, is the wick. Then there's the oil. That's the fuel for the uh, for the candle. Then there's the flame. And don't forget, there's also the cup, the cup that holds the oil. There's also the cup that holds the oil. Now, one would think <coughs> that the most important part of the candle. Um, one would think that the most important part of the candle is the flame, because obviously that's what the candle is there for, to give light, to give warmth, and to give light. Now, how does the candle work? The candle works by lighting the wick, and then the oil comes up the wick, and uh, the oil is what gives the light. So one would, one would think that uh, the main thing, obviously, is the light, the heat, uh, and, the, and, and therefore the, um, the, the most important part of the candle is really the flame. But uh, Hasidic teachings in particular uh, come along to teach us that this is not really so. There are two other aspects, and then a third one, which we'll talk about a little bit later, there are two other aspects of the candle which are also equally important. The flame comes from outside. The flame is brought from somewhere else, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the, um, the, the wick and the oil are of critical importance. Let's talk about the oil first. We said that the miracle of, ha of, of Hanukkah celebrates the finding of the jar of oil, and then it's staying lit for uh, eight days, uh, even though there was only enough oil really for one day. Now, 
the oil, the, the, the question is asked, why couldn't they just use ordinary oil? Why did it have to be the special holy oil that they used? This uncontaminated oil there was plenty of oil, but it was contaminated by being, it was defiled by the Greeks, by them touching it, etc., etc., and opening up the seals. The, 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 the oil was produced in a state of spiritual purity. And that's, in fact, what the Greeks wanted to do. What the, what the Greeks wanted to do was they wanted to show they want. They wanted. They wanted the their enemies. Or they wanted the Jewish people to live in a state where they would forget about or have to ignore the distinction between holy, pure, and unholy, impure. Now, what do I mean by this? Greek philosophy was very sort of, um, in a way you could say, a sort of hard-nosed philosophy. It was based on logic. Things that you couldn't see basically didn't exist. In other words, intangible qualities like spirituality, spiritual matters, for the Greeks were hogwash. Yes, they did have some kind of pantheon of gods and so on and so forth, but really in the academy, in the Greek academy, um, there wasn't very much emphasis on on, on the... Uh, the, the, the aspect or the forces of beyond natural forces. They only understood really the forces of nature and gave credence to. What they couldn't accept was the presence of something called holiness, holiness and unholiness. That they felt was, uh, was, was, uh, was taking things way beyond what was scientifically provable. I mean, today you, you get the same thing. Um, the distinction between um, holiness and unholiness today is not something that can be measured. It's not something that can be quantified. It's not something that you can find in the lab. And that's what they wanted to prove. Part of their whole quest when they were contaminating the oil was not merely to search the jars to see if there was anything hidden in them, they wanted to contaminate the oil to prove a point. And that point was that there is no concept of holy oil. There is no concept of holiness. So it was miraculous that oil was found that was uncontaminated. At least we certainly saw it that way, that one jar of oil that wasn't contaminated was miraculous that it was found because they did everything that they could to make sure that it was contaminated. Now, oil represents in Kabbalah, oil represents the sphira of Chochmah. And I'm going to go back to the uh, screen right now. Um, the Svira of Chochmah. Up here, Chochmah. Now, what is Chochmah all about? Chochmah in, uh, in Torah, in uh, Kabbalah rather, the concept of Chochmah is the concept of self-nullification. The inner dimension of Chochmah is called Bittul, self-nullification. You know, what does self-nullification mean? Self-nullification doesn't mean being a doormat. Self-nullification means um, overcoming or um, removing the ego, removing one's own ego, removing its... its um, the idea of Chochmah is that it is always in a state of, it's in a state of nothingness. In other words, one doesn't attribute, however great Wayne one may happen to be, one doesn't attribute one's greatness to anything other than the one above, the God. As Moses said, Moses was the, Moshe Rabbeinu was the person who represented the concept of Chochmah more than anybody else. And therefore he said, we are, what are we? Because the word chokhmah is the word koach ma, the power of whatness, the power of, in other words, the power of nothingness, the power to nullify oneself completely and simply be a conduit, a channel. So oil represents this idea. Why? Because chokhmah, being usually translated as wisdom, chokhmah as oil, oil always floats to the top of everything, to the top of every liquid. It floats on the top. But that pure, but that oil, if it's contaminated oil, even though it still floats to the top naturally, 
it automatically contaminates everything else as well. So when the, the, uh, the power of Chochmah is um, made impure, it causes everything else to be impure as well. Why? Because oil, by its nature, permeates everything. You probably know if you've got an oil stain on your clothing, it's not easy to get out, right? You can wash it a number of times, the oil stain will still be there. Because why? Uh, the expression is, Shemim Mepha Peh Bakula. Oil permeate, uh, per, uh, permeates everything, and what it permeates, it doesn't leave. In fact, at the center of every cell of, uh, of, our, uh, of our bodies, every living cell, at the center of every living cell, is in fact a globule of some kind of oil. <clears throat> which in which um, much of the production of the cell uh, goes on. I'm not a scientist, so um, uh, those who are can um, uh, can verify this and explain it a little bit better than I can. In any event, at the center of every cell is the, is the, is the idea of this drop of oil, is chokhmah. Yes, surrender the ego, that's correct. <clears throat> Um, now, someone asked the question, uh, what about metaphysics? Uh, metaphysics above the physical. Metaphysics above the physical was not a metaphysical realm in the way that we understand it today, in the way, in the way that we understand spirituality. For them, metaphysics was the basic underlying principles of physics. Metaphysics for the Greeks was the underlying principles of physics, but not the spiritual content of physics. So, um, so therefore, the uh, the oil represent could represent two things. Oil could be either the 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 oil of the the Greeks, the Greek oil, so to speak. In other words, the oil that was contaminated by oil that is contaminated by ego, or it could represent the oil of chokma. In other words, the oil of self nullification of um, the oil of lack of ego or overcoming ego or transforming ego in the best uh, in the best sense that's the oil however what about the wick now the wick seems to just be um, the way we would normally look at it the wick seems to be a completely um, almost an extraneous, it's necessary in order to draw up the oil and to catch the flame and so on and so forth, but the wick seems to be um, something that um, is ignored. Very big mistake. The oil represents the soul. The wick represents the body. And it's only together that the soul and the body can actually hold the flame. If you light a wick, It'll go out in a couple of seconds. It'll maybe burn for uh, you know for a few seconds, and then it'll go out. That's the end of it. You need the oil in order to keep it burning. But the oil itself doesn't burn without the wick. So too, the physical presence that we have in this world, our physical bodies, our physical being, is absolutely necessary in order for there to be a flame at all you can't have a you ha can't have a flame without the oil you can't have a flame without the wick or at least the lasting flame you have to have both together the soul within the body is what produces light produces light to light up the darkness although the soul itself is called god's candle ner havai nishmas adam god's candle is man's soul nevertheless uh, the 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 candleness, the light of the soul, as it is in its pristine state before it comes to the body, does not illuminate this world. It only illuminates the upper world. It doesn't illuminate the world in which we live. When the soul comes down into the body, only then can it illuminate the world. So when those two things work together, the body and the soul work together, then that can illuminate the world. However, we forgot the last, uh, we almost forgot the last component of the candle. The last component of the candle is the cup. Now, what does the cup represent? 
the concept simply represents that concept again of receptive to be receptive to things to be an open to be a vessel which can contain but it also represents the idea of a framework right the cup restricts the oil from just dissipating and splashing all over the place and uh, and um, uh, and not being able to be if, as long as the oil is contained in one place it can be a wick can be placed in it and then the flame can be lit and the candle will burn but if the oil is just spreading out everywhere and it isn't contained by anything so obviously then it's not going to make a proper candle it's not going to be able to be used properly or effectively similarly a person's life needs a framework in the same way they have to there has to be a framework a sort of a certain restrictions certain ideas which give um which which make the oil and the wick into a candle that container now what is that container that container is basically um the way we uh, the way we understand it that container is basically the framework of our lives what kind of framework do we put ourselves in what is the um lifestyle the life framework which we have set up for ourselves into which we can pour the oil and then place a wick and then light the two a very important concept that we that we, that, that that we often forget in our quest for spiritual matters what is your framework for orthodox jews for religious jews that framework is the framework of the torah and its commandments things that you have to do now the framework is extremely important let me um explain by way of an example there is a uh there is a commandment in the torah not to break the bones of the paschal lamb there there's a the the um uh, there's a lamb which is which would used to be in the times of the in temple times used to be offered uh, on Passover. It's called the Paschal lamb or the, by the Passover lamb, the Pesach lamb, the Korban Pesach in Hebrew, which would be offered. But one of the laws of the Korban Pesach is you're not allowed to break its bones, and the explanation is you don't break its bones because it's a time when we have to show ourselves as free people passover is the time when we just were liberated from egypt so you have to show yourself as a free person a slave cracks the bones and eats what's inside because he doesn't have enough food he's hungry whereas a free person uh has more largesse he has more he's he's he's, he's uh he has everything he needs he's free free of all constraints and therefore, the, uh, the, the law is we don't break the bones of the Korban Pesach, of the Paschal, uh, Passover offering. Now, there is a uh, book called the Chinuch. And the Chinuch, he, he, ex he explains all of the commandments of the Torah. And one of the things that he does when he explains that, he, he, always, he tries to explain the reason for everything. So one of the reasons, the reason that he gives for this, for not breaking the bones, he says, is because after the action, the heart is drawn. After the actions, the heart is drawn. In other words, a person's emotions are arousable in two ways. Either through intellect. If you have a look over here, the intellectual faculties are the top three faculties over here, Chochmah, Bina, and Da'at, right? And those give rise to, give birth to, particularly through Bina, give birth to the emotional faculties of the, the emotional faculties of the soul. However, there is another way in which the emotional faculties of the soul can be aroused, and that is through action. If a person doesn't have or is not able to uh, to focus and to concentrate and to understand, to understand and to and to have the intellectual capacity, or simply doesn't have the time, 
or it's not working to have the intellect arouse the emotions, then one can arouse the emotions through action, through proper action. Now, I'll give you an example of this. It's well known, uh, perhaps not among psychiatrists, but it's well known amongst those who use alternative means other than uh, psychiatry and perhaps even psychology. Uh, apologies to the psychologists here. I know there's one or two on, <laughs> on board uh, right now. <clears throat> but um, one of the things that can be done when a person, for example, is very, let's say a person is depressed, one it's very difficult for depressed people to to move around to move they get they're very lethargic very stodgy like that hard to get them to move if you can get a depressed person to move you'll lighten the depression automatically especially if you can get him to move with alacrity even if you have to force him into it one of the things that i suggest to people who to especially to ladies who are depressed when they come to me as a coach I suggest that they, one of the things that they, that they should do is go to a dance class. Go and dance to music, preferably um, not raunchy music, but, uh, you know, um, music that, any kind of music that, uh, that, that wakes up a person, makes him feel, uh, you know, sort of, uh, makes him autom almost dance automatically. Go and join a dance class. If you don't have a dance class, if you don't want to go to one or whatever, turn on the radio or get a record or a tape or something like that put it on, and start dancing. Because the heart is drawn after the action. If you act, you will find that the emotions follow. So you might think, well, I'm just faking it. You're not faking it. That's the way it works. And even if you are faking it, fake it until you make it is, a, is an expression that's, <laughs> that's sometimes used. Fake it until you make it. By which we mean that the truth is that it's not faking it. If you feel that it's faking, it doesn't matter. Just use whatever means is necessary to get to where it is that you want. Obviously, we're not talking about illegal or illicit or, uh, or, or uncouth or whatever means. We don't mean anything goes. But anything that's legitimate should be used in the pursuit of what it is that we want to achieve uh, in the world at this particular time or, or at any time. So, therefore, the, uh, the, the, the cup of the, uh, of the, in which the oil is contained is also an extreme, the framework through which a person, this is called the framework of, of action in particular, speech and action, but uh, the cup always represents the sphere of malchut, Malchut, in fact, Malchut is the source of thought, speech, and deed. Not the intellectual faculties of, as such, but practical, actual thinking, speaking, and acting. So Malchut being the kli, being, being the vessel, is, even though Malchut is one of the seven spherot, nevertheless, the subdivision of Malchut is also part of the Eight days of Hanukkah, it represents the eight days of Hanukkah as well, thought, speech, and deed. And that thought, speech, and deed are the vessels which hold all of the oil and everything else. It's a key and a clue as to um, how to make the seven days, make the, uh, the, 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 the days of the week, in other words, the emotion, the seven emotions of the soul, how to make them into luminous emotions or illuminating emotions emotions which give light and not which cause darkness you know some people you will find the charles mansons of the world and so on and so forth very very charismatic but charismatic in an incredibly negative way so when you get into their presence they almost give you the chills they're evil people like that who uh who there's such a darkness about their souls and such a heaviness and a burdensomeness about them that they sort of, it's like a black hole, sucks everything in. And um, there are, unfortunately, people like that. We have to be the opposite. We have to be the, uh, instead of the light being drawn into the black hole, we have to be the opposite uh, end of the black hole, so to speak, the white hole, which gives out the light. 
where the light now becomes um, spreads out from. That is what we should be. Uh, so, therefore, the whole concept of Hanukkah, which giving light, we have to break that down a little bit more and understand that the giving light of Hanukkah is not only the flame which is applied from the outside. In 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 uh, in fact, um, as we said before, the flame of the candelabra in the temple was lit from the one that burned through miraculously the entire day. However, if uh, that flame, for whatever reason, would have gone out, then it's drawn, it's taken from another flame on the altar, um, on, on one of the altars, etc. I don't, we don't need to get into it now, but the, um, the idea is that the flame sort of comes from the outside. The flame is what is given. The flame is what is given by God, essentially. And if we bring the, 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 the soul within the body is the oil and the wick and the framework by which we live. If we have those things, then the, um, the one who lights the menorah, the one who lights the Hanukkah, the candelabra, in other words, the, the flame which essentially comes from God, that vitality, that, uh, that, uh, that luminousness, has what to uh, reside within, or has what to dwell upon. And um, that, therefore, is the really the, the secret of Hanukkah is what we the secret of the candle is how we understand what our part is uh, is in that. The light comes from above. The candle in the wick is what uh, the, the oil in the wick is what we were given within the framework of the cup, and those things are what are in our control. If we make sure that the oil is pure oil, not contaminated by all kinds of strange and weird uh, ideas, but the oil is purified by a certain feeling of nullification, of it's not me who did this, it's not me who brought me here, it's not me who brought me my health, it's not me who brought me my wealth, whatever it is, attributed to the source from where it all comes, that selflessness and sharing with others, that's the purification of the oil, then the wick, which is even the physical body, becomes lit. How do we um, uh, make sure that this is all working properly, that it's all gathered together in one place, isn't spread out or, uh, and, 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 uh, and um, scattered. Make sure that the framework that holds it all together is a framework of positive action, positive thoughts, positive speech, and um, then everything will be contained in the right place and be ready for the candle to be lit. And light up the darkness. Um, there were a couple of questions which I'm going to address now. Uh, let's see here. Um, could it be that soul expresses itself through a signature, unique expression of the light emanating from spirit, which is the light itself which we all share? Yeah. Uh, I would say that that is correct, uh, Terry. Yes. That the, the light, the, 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 the spirit, which is the light itself we all share, yes which comes from above. Um, Christian happiness, etc. Right. All right. So are there any other questions? Any questions? No. Well, either the no questions or everyone's going to sleep. So <laughs> we'll stop here.